thank you for the opportunity to share today. So we're going to be talking about uh, implementing CVCRM in a small charity with limited IT resources. And I thought this is what we're planning to go through in, in a short space of time. We're going to set the scene, first of all, then about building the foundation, launching successfully, exploring innovation, looking ahead, and then there's an appendix at the end. So there's a lot to get through in a short space of time. But we thought it'd be good to start by putting in some context and telling you a little bit about Embracing Age. So we are a small charity. We're based in... Um, Twickenham in West London, Borough of Richmond. We had four um, part-time members of staff when we started our journey with CBCRM, now got eight. Um, but one of the things for a Christian charity that I founded back in 2014, mm -hmm. and one of our primary activities is mobilising volunteers to befriend care home residents. Um, we started in the borough of Richmond, we're now on the Isle of Wight and in Hampshire. And we've also got some projects with a national reach as well. So our project supporting informal carers and another project encouraging churches to adopt a local care home. As I say, we had four part-time members of staff when we started um, this journey with Civi. Um, we have no IT staff in our charity and um, I'm probably the most IT literate um, amongst our staff at the moment and my background is nursing so that just gives you a bit of an idea of where we're at. Um, we were, prior to moving to Civi, we were using Insightly CRM and we've been using that for about five years. So why did we move from Insightly and why did we choose Civi? Well, we recruit a lot of volunteers and we take them through quite a rigorous process of uh, recruitment and vetting and training uh, before we deploy them into care homes. Um, and we also have lots of other donors and stakeholders and other people involved. Um, there's a lot of good things about Insightly. It's simple to use. It integrates well with Google. But we were becoming increasingly frustrated with it. And these were the things that we wanted to do. We wanted to be able to take our contacts on a journey. Now, you can do that a little bit within Insightly, but it's geared up for business, not for charities. We wanted to be able to process donations on our, on our, um, in our system. We wanted to be able to manage events so that we had, when we looked at an individual or contact within our system, we really had a kind of 360 view of that individual. We also wanted to be able to do more automation of tasks without it costing us a fortune. We wanted a system that was easy to use and it needed to be affordable as well. So our first step was to advertise for a volunteer to help us uh, because we knew we couldn't do it on its own, on, on our own. And we said, oh yeah, probably needs a couple of hours a week. Um, anyway, Patrick volunteered to help us. Unfortunately, he was as naive as we were in terms of the uh, timing of it. And um, his first job was to have a look at what was out there in terms of different systems. And he presented different, a few different systems to us. And we all decided that Civi was the way forward. It was within our budget. We could take people on journeys and we could implement the auto automation and it could also grow with us as well without becoming hugely, hugely expensive. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Patrick. And Patrick, shall I do the slide? You can say next slide, please. Does that sound okay? Cool? That would be great, yeah, that would be great. Next slide then, uh, Tina. All right, so yeah, next one again. Yeah, so I think I'm going to talk about, uh, I suppose I'm focusing on the kind of implementation, how we went about the implementation, uh, Tina and I. And uh, she's already touched on some of what I'm going to cover. So we started off, uh, before we got hold of the software, we spent about two months, uh, which I call the discovery phase. Uh, I needed to get up to speed on the use that um, Embracing Age made of Insightly. So I need to understand how all that worked uh, first and really understand uh, why was it that Tina and her staff were wanting to move away from Insightly uh, and then do some research. I, I have to put up my hand and admit that uh, prior to volunteering for this project, I didn't know what a CRM system was. So I was literally starting at the beginning. I had to look up what a CRM system was. Um, but I did some with Tina, we did some research on 
various options. And I think I felt very strongly that probably the thing we're going to do here is make better use of Encycli. That's kind of the bias I came into because I'm a sort of uh, don't rock the boat if not necessary. So I, I thought maybe we can make a better and fuller use of Encycli that the staff is already familiar with. So that was definitely on the consideration list. Then we decided to look at some big hitters. Uh, so Salesforce and uh, Microsoft Dynamics. Uh, because um, you want to go for the big guys uh, in, when you're doing this research. And then um, I came across um, CVCRM, and I'm a closet geek, and so I love the idea of open source, and so I definitely wanted to put that on the list. I was thinking Tina wouldn't be for it, so I, I you know, with trepidation, asked her, should we consider this? And I was really happy that she was also a closet geek. So we um, we put that on the list. And then I thought to include others um, like Charity Log, and there were some other ones as well. Oh yeah, down the bottom, Simply Connect Core CRM Database. I wanted to have kind of smaller ones represented on the list, but we in the end decided that probably because the, the charity was already using Encycli, and there wouldn't be really much point in adding those. It's unlikely we're gonna go from kind of one smallish thing to another smallish thing. Uh, we would rather stick with Encycli. So we really did most of our uh, research then on these four, SPAR, uh, CVCRM, Microsoft Dynamics, 365, Salesforce, and Encycli. Um, I feel like it was an omission not to look at HubSpot because somebody told me about that afterwards and I feel that was an omission. But anyway, it wasn't on our, um, it wasn't on our, on our roster. And uh, we, I think the way we, it was a great suggestion, I think, by Sarah in um, Tina's team was uh, they provided me with some use cases and I tried to implement those in a kind of a test system with CVCRM and um, Microsoft Dynamics, Salesforce and Cycling and so on. And that's how we judged, would this be helpful or, or not? You know, would, would this be the kind of solution we wanted to pursue or not? In the end, I came up with this uh, hokey table there. You know, you can score these so many different ways. Depending on how you put the weights, you'll get a different answer. But it reflected, I think, our thinking. So uh, we looked at um, the cost, including the extensions, and we rated them from one to four or five. I don't remember. Uh, the user friendliness, like so just your typical user, how easy it is to use the system. The, um, the As an admin, how difficult is to use the system? And then what's the risk that we pursue this and it actually won't deliver what we want in the end? Um, and so you can see the way we scored them. And I think CVCRM you know, came out tops in cost, including like the extensions. Like when you think about Salesforce is free, Microsoft Dynamics is free, but once you begin adding in the extensions, uh, at least our understanding is it gets costly quickly. Um, so that's why they didn't do so well on that. And then risk, um, yes, yeah, CVCRM came out tops here because it was easy-ish to implement the use cases that uh, Tina came up with. So we had fairly high confidence um, that if we pursued CVCRM, it would do what uh, the charity wanted to do. Um, so that's how we that's what we did for the first couple of months. I have to say here, I got enormous help from um, the Spark CVCRM enterprise. Uh, those people are so helpful. And there's no way I would have been able to implement my use case, the use cases from Tina's team if I didn't have all the help in Spark CVCRM. So I, I really want to shout out to them. They were just, I never came across such uh, great help and service and so on. Anyway, so we chose CVCRM. And then it took us about four, four months to implement everything we wanted to do with the system. Um, Tina and I met a couple of times, but mostly we interacted over Asana, Google Workspace, and Zoom. It was, uh, I think, a new experience for both me and Tina using Asana, but we really liked it. Uh, so we would just, um, you know, assign each other's tasks and dialogue back and forth with them and attach whatever we wanted. So that, that all worked out pretty well. Uh, here's how we organized the, the project. Uh, so we basically organized it into six groupings uh, that we worked through pretty much sequentially. Uh, so I'm going to talk you through some of those in a moment. Uh, the configuration, that was really two parts. Uh, it was learning the functionality of the system and then configuring it. So I'll, I'll bring you through some examples of that uh, because how we, what we basically would do is we would go through menu item by menu item 
I would take a look at it first of all. I might read a book. I'd explain, uh, you know, I, 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 I'd figure out how it worked first of all. I'd meet with Tina and I would explain how I think it works. And then I would tell her the choices that have to be made. Um, like let's say when you're configuring mail or when you're setting up contacts or whatever activities, I'd tell her the decisions that have to be made. She'd go away and think about it. And then we'd meet one more time and we'd actually configure the system. Um, and that's the way we did it. We worked through it uh, menu grouping by menu grouping. It's a bit boring that bit, you know, because there are a lot of decisions and some of them are kind of trivial and so on. Uh, so we we allowed ourselves to have kind of one menu item, one menu grouping a, a week, and we didn't go mad in that way. And we got through it in a, in a short enough time. So that's what configuration was about. Then data migration, um, Tina's team provided me with all the data. And um, I, I guess I did that mostly on my own. I figured out how to get that into CVCRM. Super easy to get the data into CVCRM. The challenge was that, of course, when you when you export data from legacy systems, you find there are lots of problems in the data. So I spent a fair amount of time cleaning it up. Uh, that was the hard work. I think the actual import into CVCRM was super easy, super, super easy. So you get two benefits. You get cleaner data, and the actual migration is pretty easy once you have the clean data. CMS integration, that, you know, Tina's been mentioning they wanted to use CVCRM for donations, to manage events, to manage volunteer applications, all that kind of stuff. And they have a superb uh, website already. So CMS integration was integrating CVCRM with their existing content management scheme. Uh, we thought about, uh, we were running CVCRM on WordPress. We did think about migrating their existing CMS over to WordPress. It's running on Weebly, but somebody gave us some very good advice and said, don't do that. Um, a lot of work, unnecessary work. So we found a way to integrate the existing Weebly website uh, with WordPress running on, with the CVCRM running on WordPress. So that was, that was the CMS integration. Then training we did together. Uh, we provided a day of training. I'm sure Tina has provided a lot more besides, but we had kind of one dedicated day of training for the staff, uh, so that everybody was comfortable with um, with using CVCRM. And uh, maybe Tina will say more about that later, how that went. Um, then you know all the things we need to remember about the Go Live. We part on that Go Live project in Asana, uh, so we'll, I think Tina is going to talk about that. And then we had three other projects or places to park things. Uh, Tina's queries, so she would think about things that she wanted to do. I'd pick them up and try and get them done, and then we discuss how I did it. Teething problems, uh, so she or I would discover problems, and we just park them there, and I would try and get through them. And then we had more or less weekly meetings, I think, or maybe every two weeks we had a meeting uh, to talk through the progress and the various items and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, that, that's how we organized the project. I said it took more than 200 hours. That's my side. I think it probably took Tina maybe uh, similar. I don't, I don't know. I would caveat that 200 hours. So it only took 200 hours because 100 of those hours I was learning the system from scratch. Or I can remember, I didn't know what CRM meant. So in reality, if you knew what you were doing, it would have, it would have definitely taken less than 200 hours. Like, uh, in the unlikely event I go through this again, it won't be 200 hours. It will be something a lot shorter because I can now skip the learning phase and just kind of concentrate on the on the work and the the, the core implementation. So, you know, I hope I don't scare anybody off um, with those 200 hours. And Tina and I often said, although we were incredibly naive getting into it, because she did tell me it was going to be two hours, <laughs> two hours a week. Um, it was super fun, and we really enjoyed doing it. And it was, yeah, it was a super it's a super piece of software. We really enjoyed working with it. So I'm going to say a little bit more about configuration next. Uh, Tina, if you can move on. Great, yeah. So this is the configuration. I, I won't uh, spend too much of on, on this, but um, I'm going to start on that little box in the top left. You know, the first thing under configuration is we have to get a hosted CVCRM. Um, and so we did a little bit of uh, research there again. We compared CVCRM Spark. And they had given me fantastic help uh, on, on the kind of uh, use cases that I implemented. So I was definitely sold on customer support. We also looked at Bluehost. So that would have been more ambitious. Uh, just they would provide a, a shared host. And we'd install WordPress and CVCRM software on that. So that was a little bit scary because that's that they're opposite ends, I would say. CVCRM, 
they do all the setup for you. Uh, they'll do much of the configuration. They're experts in CVCRM. Bluehost, I don't know. I'm sure they know what CVCRM is, but you know they're not a CVCRM hosting company. They they host websites. So that's like the opposite end if you, for the brave or those who really know what they're doing. And then uh, I think we ended up in the, somewhere in the middle, finally. We ended up with Civi Hosting, which I guess is a, um, they provide shared hosts. Um, they provide the Civi CRM software, but you do much of the configuration yourself. So it's somewhere between Civi CRM Spark and Bluehost. Uh, I think we're happy where we ended up. If um, there is, I mean, we definitely would have gone with Civi CRM Spark, but for one thing, and that's the flexibility to decide which extensions we use uh, because we do make extensive use of all the extensions which are like fantastic we list those in the uh, appendix and they really do like enable fantastic functionality in cvcrm but CV CRM spark you know wants to offer a straightforward solution they don't want to over it and so they control what extensions are turned on I would say in my experience, if, if the extensions they've turned on do the job for you, you should definitely go with CVC or in Spark. Uh, that, based on my limited experience, that's what I would do. But if they don't support the extensions you want, which was our case, um, then you have to look at something else. So we ended up looking at CVC or M. So we went for those guys. And then there was some other work to do, like register with Stripe for donations, uh, register with Amazon, simple email service for email, and so on and so forth. So that was the first bit. Then the second bit is, uh, now we're kind of moving to the right, the big panel on the right, uh, was just to work through the functionality in, CR in CVCRM. And again, there was it was always a three-step a three -step process. I would figure out how it worked. I'd play with it myself, step one. Step two, I would try and teach that back to um, Tina, and that would show up, you know, all the limitations in my understanding, because uh, she would ask a lot of questions. But somehow we get there where we both had a common understanding of what the functionality was. She would go away and think about it, like how it needs to be configured. And then we would regroup in the third step, and we would actually configure it together, doing a screen share. And we'd move from one to the other. So these correspond to menu items in CVCRM, administer, contacts, blah, 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 blah email. Um, we did look at using Google Mail, and I think that was a starting point. We may have configured that as well. So um, I am a enthusiastic amateur here, and uh, one thing that Tina was concerned about, because she had experience with it, was emails going directly into the spam folder. And uh, Tina had another volunteer who was more, who's a proper IT professional, and he advised us to use something he gave us several choices but he advised us to use something like amazon ses um with some of those mail gone there were several he mentioned he thought that would increase our chances of um getting the, the email delivered to donors volunteers and so on and so forth and not ending up in the spam uh, filters that's that's what motivated us rightly or wrongly that's what motivated us to use amazon simple email service wasn't super simple to set up, but that's probably you know limited knowledge on, on my side. Um, did City Hosting say you could not use their service? They did, but um, this our, our other volunteer, he was saying in the nicest possible way that configuring a mail system in a way that it it's it's what it's sending out doesn't go to a spam filter is a job of a professional. Uh, he's kind of guiding us away from that. Um, and I guess if we had done CV, I, I just don't know the reputation of CV hosting mail servers. Uh, Google presumably have a good, have good, uh, have good reputation. But yeah, might not have been the right decision. But it essentially, it was it was driven by a desire to have as many of the emails coming out of the system and not going to spam as possible. Uh, and that's why we went with Amazon simple, simple email service. So it might not be the best answer for everybody, but it's what we pursued. So that's the configuration. Um, and then uh, we got to other configurations. So that bit, I would say, was a little bit boring, you know, because it was it got a bit monotonous going through those menu items. But, you know, we did one a week and we got through it. And then the, I think the more interesting bit was these ones on the bottom uh, left, because here it actually took a lot of thought. And often, like, uh, Tina and her team would sketch out exactly what they wanted. So one of the super, super extensions is Civi Rules. Uh, which allows, you know, things like when a form is submitted, lots of automation to be kicked off 
Um, so it's kind of like a, a programming language almost within CDTRM, but all kind of click and drag. You don't actually write code. Um, but you know, you have to really think about what are the rules? What are the rules? Like things about chasing volunteers if they haven't submitted them, their application or you know, opening up a case for one of Athena's case managers to, um, to act on if a new application is received, things like that. Uh, so I guess they're business rules. So Tina would have to explain to me the business rules and then I'd have a go at implementing the city rules. So that was kind of a more involved, uh, uh, but higher value sort of configuration. Uh, reporting, we didn't end up using CV report at all, and uh, we but search kit fantastic, so a really amazing uh, piece of software. Uh, so we used that, and Tini came up with you know various queries. I guess they're quite similar to SQL queries, but you don't write SQL. And so she would come up with various reports she wanted to see, uh, or smart groups she wanted to, she wanted to create. Smart groups are like queries that run dynamically, so. You know, you have a group, but the contents of the group is being refreshed. So, you know, it could be like donors above a certain amount in the last three months. Every time you click into that smart group, it refreshes the list. So that took some configuration. And then GDPR and UK gift aid, uh, very simple to configure, but we had to understand what do the rates actually mean in there. So we were we were more thoughtful about those those three or four pieces of functionality and we're a bit more careful in configuring them because uh, it could really make a difference. So that's that slide. Uh, maybe we move on to the next slide. Um, uh, oh, there's a document. Okay, uh, great. I'll have a look at that, William. Uh, then migrating the data. Um, uh, I think the functionality in CVCRM is super uh, because it's very clever about um, mapping mapping fields that are in the legacy data to the new fields in CVCRM. It's also very clever about, um, you know, identifying duplicates. So organizations or individuals that seen before, because very likely the legacy data, it's coming from several different systems and the same contact might be represented in all, all of those different legacy systems. So I thought on the CVCRM, that was a super strong point, I would say. Um, the work here really was the data, of course, any data from any legacy system has problems. And so, you know, uh, I've put that little icon on the top right hand corner, that kind of circular thing, just to remind me how circular this process was, because I would get kind of to the third row of this table and then I realized I'd made a big mistake and I go back and start again. So that was a little bit painful, uh, but it's just the data. And the benefit was, I guess we have better data now because um, we've improved the data. And it was just things like, you know, um, like uh, fields in the legacy, you know, postal codes being entered as phone numbers or, I don't know, counties having strange names, things like that. Uh, not, not, nothing that would prevent a human being from understanding what was going on, but difficult for a computer. Um, all I want to mention there is we used a couple of tools that were really, uh, I found very helpful there so i just i provided hyperlinks to them uh open refine is a super super tool it's a bit like excel but it's uh, for cleaning up messy data it's definitely worth trying it it's free i think it's some spin-off from google so that was that was super fun to use and a uh, very simple thing is uh i kept on finding these non-ascii characters which op open open city or cdcrm didn't like and so i used that web tool to strip them out uh, so i found that kind of useful but very straightforward, I would say, the transition of data. Uh, if you have good data, it's very easy to get them into the CRM. Uh, maybe the next slide, Tina. Yeah, this bit was, um, I think uh, we got help here from a proper IT professional who's also volunteering with Tina. I think, I, I don't know too much about web stack, and all that kind of stuff. I, I think it was a good solution we came up with. Um, maybe the useful thing I can, um, Maybe the useful thing I can say is here, I made a big mistake here, which I would give to any uh, person who's volunteering for a charity in, in this sort of way. I made a big state mistake here. I burnt a lot of time on different ways of building forms. Uh, so I looked at Form Builder, which um, maybe contentiously, I would say it was a bit underwhelming. I didn't, I didn't like it or find it that useful. I looked at WP Forms, which was a bit expensive. I looked at context seven form seven, which I kind of fell in love with and said, we should definitely use that. But I wasn't listening to Tina because what Tina was telling me was we're perfectly happy with Google forms. And that was what I should have done. I should have forgotten all those other solutions. I should have used Google forms in the beginning because that's what they were used to using. 
um, they had already had Google Forms set up. They knew how to create them. And they were deeply uh, sort of uh, embedded in their existing architecture. So the, the, the magic trick was to find this post on Stack Exchange, which explained how you integrate Google Forms with CBCRM. And then I could reuse all the forms they had, uh, and we could hook up the Google Form to something called a form processor. So this is uh, something that uh, receives the data from the Google Form and does stuff with it, including like kicking off CV rules, including you know sending emails, opening cases. So the form processor is sort of like having a human being receiving the data from Google Forms and doing lots of automatic stuff in CVCRM. Um, so when we combine Google Forms with CVCRM form processor uh, with CV rules, this other automation thing, and a few and several other extensions, I mean, we ended up with amazingly flexible uh, input channel. So you would you send data into CVCRM now, and all manner of things get kicked off. Um, and what I've really been happy about is. I see Tina uh, like building on what we've done now, and um, you know, uh, building up new functionality with this sort of paradigm, which is great because it's obviously a failure if it's seen. Tina says she's not a technical person; she started off in nursing. She's plenty technical, but like me, she's not from an IT background. So I think it's fantastic that the director of the charity is actually able to create new business rules in CVCRM using this this paradigm. And I think part of that is because you know she understands Google Forms, and now she understands enough about form processors and, and, and that sort of stuff uh, to glue it all together. So I've been really happy to see that uh, these processes that she's put together, they, they, they've, built, they've gone further than you know, when I left them. Uh, I, I don't entirely understand them, but thankfully, we're, they're documented. And then the final bit was uh, how Google Forms is integrated with the CMS was through iframes, uh, which I only have a very rudimentary understanding of. But I gather it's a way of making a web page on one server appear on a web page on another server. Uh, so these Google Forms, I suppose, all reside. I don't know where they reside. Um, uh, they don't. They don't reside in the CMS anyway. Um, and somehow this iframes brings them onto the CMS system. That that's how we glued it all together. So that was our kind of solution, uh, which we were very happy with, and it, it worked very well. And as I say, the one mistake to make there was pursuing all these other forms uh, when. Google Forms is the right solution from the beginning here, we thought, anyway. And then I think it's my last slide is the next one. Yeah. And then the last slide for me is, um, yeah, I just want to say uh, there's a great community around CVCRM because people are so generous with their time. Um, and I've sort of met it in order of where we got the help from. So uh, Spark, the CVCRM Spark, were super, super helpful in the beginning and uh, taught us a lot. And then the next one was Stack Exchange. Uh, we probably asked what for us were 10 or 12 really difficult, mind boggling, showstopper questions, and they were all answered. Uh, you know, in Australia, New Zealand, you know, Germany, whatever. Somebody always answered them. So that was fantastic. Uh, the CVCRM documentation, I think it's very good uh, and well organized and well laid out, and it's possible to read it. So that, that was pretty good. And we also got some help from CV hosting. Uh, they uh, they solved a few problems from as well, and then this is the book we used on the top right hand corner um, using CVCRM second edition. So that's the help, but there's plenty of help out there. Uh, yeah, it was a really good experience from that. So that's me, Don. I I have um, I I won't go to it, but in the very appendix, uh, the, you'll see the extensions that we actually ended up using. Um, but that that's me, Don. Yeah, thanks, Tina. Back to you. Thanks, Patrick. So I'm going to talk about how we launched. Um, so I think it's important um, to say that our staff were on board from the outset. Um, we, as I say, we had four staff at the time, and then we had three more come on board during the process. So we didn't want to start them on the old system and then put them on the new system. So we really were starting from ground zero with the training. Um, we'd already chatted to our staff about the need for a new system and everyone was really keen to have this 360 view of their volunteers and other stakeholders and also to take people on journeys. Um, as Patrick said, everything took longer than we anticipated. So I think we, we started looking at things in August 22 and we implemented in March 23. And so we just set our launch date back from when we had set our implement um, 
we set our launch date in, and then work back in terms of when to do the training. One really important aspect that I'm going to show you in a minute was a shared user guide that we created. We had two training mornings. The first one Patrick did a lot of, and then the second one I did more. And then once we'd had those training mornings, we did them over Zoom because we're quite a spread out team. Uh, we gave staff a few weeks to play on the system and they created lots of um, test contacts. And so the only rule we had was anything you create has to have test in the name somewhere so that we can delete it. Um, and then we had this go live week where we ironed out all our initial challenges um, before we really used it fully and before I uh, decommissioned in slightly. So just to tell you a little bit about the user guide. Oh, oh hang on now, I've got to try and find this. Um, I want to show you something. It would just take me a minute to get there. Um, this was our user guide. So you can see it's 51 pages. A lot of it is cut and pasted from the online manual but we've simplified it for our so we've shown this kind of diagram of what contacts mean and things like that but one thing we did do we also incorporated our processes into it so um if i show you volunteer management is a really important part of what we do so what we did in the user manual we talked about in part one this is the embracing age process for recruit the recruitment vetting and placement of volunteers that was our first part I'm not going to go all through this it take ages but then in part two we had a user guide so this was the ABC of for our coordinators this is what you need to do within CIVI um, to when you're recruiting a new volunteer so they can just um, go through that step by step I have to say what a lot of our um, staff did in the end they printed off this user guide and they have it next to them I mean, you can't old habits and everything but that works for them so that's fine um the only thing is we do update it but there we are um and then at the end of that we then had this summary of the city crn implementation because it, everything does get quite complicated and it's really easy to forget what you've done so if ever we need to remember how did we do that then we've got this summary of the city crm implementation but it's kind of grayed out so that our staff our general users don't have to worry that part. and then there's a few other references so that if we think about oh where, where did we read about how to do that we've got that in there so that's our user guide and it's been really important in training up new staff and being a reference point for everybody i'm going to come back to the powerpoint now um so in terms of so then we did these training and in the training it was really again going from very basics and then we gave people opportunities to practice like this is how you add a contact this is how you send an email things like that but then they always had the user guide to fall back on um then yeah so it's, it is a living document our user guide so staff can add to it but it kind of defeats the object when they printed it off but never mind um i would say that our sort of going live went incredibly well you know because the staff were so on board from the outset they picked it up because they had the user guide to fall back on um and they had those couple of weeks just to play with the system it really went incredibly well and they loved it and they loved having this um compared to what we had in insightly to be able to click on a volunteer and see everything about that volunteer on one page was amazing um we did have a few teething problems at implementation so i'm glad we had those week or two where we knew there might be problems and before we kind of decommissioned insightly um patrick explained to you about google forms and everything it is quite a complex system and what we found first was not all the information that people put into google forms went across all the time sometimes it did sometimes it didn't so then the challenge was working out what's gone wrong and and what would happen i would have a go and then i'd get really frustrated and i would then say patrick i can't do this and he'd look and invariably work it out or if he couldn't work it out he'd put on the stack exchange asking for help and we also had um a couple of times where the automation went wrong because um people would have one email address initially then when they completed their application form they would use a different email address and it just messed up the 
the automation and then they got sent chasers when they'd already completed application forms um, and we also had a few problems with our permissions which meant that event registration wasn't working properly but you know we managed to I say we it was mainly Patrick to be fair sort out all these um issues so that was how we launched successfully in terms of exploring innovation Patrick's gone through a lot so I won't say too much um one of the things I love about Insightly is the not Insightly Civi is the um different layouts you can have so again I'm going to show you a screen so this for example is um a carer so we have different types of individuals in our system. We have carers, we have volunteers, referees, and I think one other staff. Um, and each summary sheet has a different layout to it. So with a carer, these are our informal carers who come to our um, Zoom gatherings. I can see immediately who their, their key information, the name of the person they're caring for, the relationship, any key facts about the individual, like they've got dementia. Um, so that's our layout for carers and then you can you can do different all sorts of different layouts so just to give you a different example this is our layout for volunteers so this is far more complex um but here we can see the answers they put into their um volunteer application form that that they fill that out on google and it comes into the system but we can also hold it down this is volunteer milestones this is for stewardship we haven't quite implemented that yet um, we can see the answer to self-declaration form. We can see any relationships they've got, events, contributions. Obviously, this is just a test page that I'm showing you, so it hasn't got all that in. And one thing I, I really love, at one point, I was like, how can I link it to, because every volunteer has a file within Google that has various stuff in it. And so that's what we worked out. We could put a um, hyperlink in here. And now that takes me to my that particular volunteer is called test volunteer his their folder at the moment i've only got their profile in that's the profile that we send out to care homes about the volunteer but all other in files that we need for that individual are in there and it's then linked into their um summary profile as well so that's profiles and layouts um Patrick's talked about this, but having all the automation that chases up volunteers um, has been brilliant. And that's something Patrick worked out how to do it. And it just means that rather than us having to send emails out to say, oh, you haven't filled out your application form yet, it's all done automatically, which is brilliant, and then stops when they complete the application form. Form processors. We use form processors a lot, and I want to show you that. Um, so these are our form processes that we use they're really powerful there's lots of different ones there but i want to show you this one probably the most complicated one is our volunteer application form so they complete their application form on a google form it comes into this um form processor and you can see normal things name age email etc etc and that's everything the referees and then these are the actions. So once it's that form processor um, checks, is this person in the system? If they are, they just add to their profile or they create them if they're not there. Um, it puts them on one of our journeys, which is, or cases, betting investment. It informs the coordinator for that area. Um, well, it does lots of things. It also, for every each of their referees, it creates a contact with the subtype referee um, and then creates a relationship. So I can look on the profile of a volunteer, see who their referees are, then I can just click into that referee, click on their email address, and use an email template to send them the um, reference request. So it really makes that a very quick process. So that's just to give you a bit of an idea of how we use form processes. Um, and then the other thing we use a lot is cases. So we call them journeys. And that's one of the reasons we really wanted a new CRM system was to be able to take people on journeys. So again, I'll show you this briefly. 
So this shows you the different journeys we've had. We've got journey for a care home resident that's referred to us for if they want a befriending volunteer. One of our biggest journeys and complicated one is the vetting and placement of volunteers. And there's lots of others as well. So I'll show you this one. Um, show you the timeline. So when, when somebody um, fills out their application form, a case is automatically open for vetting and placement. And then all these activities come as to do's for scheduled activities for the coordinator of that area to send off references, invite them to training, log the training, and there's a whole list. And then ones that involve emails, there's email templates set up for all of these. So this is how we use cases and it's, it's really good and really powerful. So that's all I wanted to say about innovation. Looking ahead, what we're thinking of doing in the future, or we're working on at the moment, um, for our volunteers, um, well, we call it the stewardship of volunteers, and the first journey of that is getting them on board, but then we want to make sure that we're looking after them when they are on board, and so we're setting things up within insight that we can steward them really well. Um, We've also, at the moment, we still use CAF for our giving platform on our website, but we have we've set everything up ready now for uh, City Contribute to be our giving platform on the website. But we didn't want to implement it over the summer when everyone was away, so we're just waiting to do that. And again, the stewardship of donors, we're we've set everything up in City. We're just not using it properly at the moment, so that's sort of the things we're looking at doing at the moment going forward so then final just conclusions really about it um you need a patrick we couldn't have done this without patrick and as i say um both patrick and i were very blissfully naive at the beginning of this post process which is probably just as well because i think we probably wouldn't have started on it if uh, we knew what it was going to uh, entail. But having said that, every step of the way, we were when it was involving so many hours, we were both saying, is this worth it? Are you sure this is OK? And we were both actually really enjoying the process. Um, but if you're a small charity like ours, if you've got a limited budget, you really need a Patrick on board to help. Um, I would say we've both been on a very steep learning curve, but it's a learning curve we've really enjoyed um and for the benefits for us it's definitely been worth it you know we've now got a rounded picture of all our contacts and the journeys we're taking them on we can see in that one summary screen the donations people have made the events that they've attended so we don't use eventbrite anymore um we've also we used to use mailchimp for our newsletters whereas that's all in mosaico now so that's all um is it all within the one system so we can see who's on what newsletter in the one system um and also the we can automate processes so easily now and that used to be so processes that were time consuming and and what's been wonderful and what is wonderful looking ahead is that the system can grow with us um without it costing us an arm and a leg and it means that we can put more of our time and more of our resources into improving the lives of care and residents and older people which is in the end what we're all about so that's all in terms of presentation but i'm sure you've got questions so i'm going to stop sharing patrick did you have something to add uh, something to add uh, no i think uh, tina covered it all very nicely i, I can't uh, i can't think we've we've, we've um exhausted our knowledge i think but we're happy to answer any questions Great. Well, thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. Um, so I, I meant to share a document for questions. Um, so sorry for not doing that earlier, but here's the link to it. And I can see, Patrick, you've already answered some of those questions. And there's been some in the chat as well, which I think you've answered. But there's a few new ones in the chat. So maybe um, you could go through those. So one of them was about which payment processor do you use? So Tina, do you want to go, go with that, Patrick? I, no, you. Well, you're the one closer to the money, so you you answer that one. Okay, so we we've got we use Stripe um, at the moment. I just did what Patrick told me to do, so that's what he said. <laughs> Is that fair yeah. to say, Patrick? 
Yeah, that is pretty much it. I don't know why we chose, I can't remember why we chose Stripe. I'd heard of Stripe, I guess. Um, I saw the little square things. They looked reputable. And there was a, a extension uh, already in CBCM to connect with Stripe. It was very straightforward to set up. Um, I know there were others as well, uh, but that's what we started with. And it's worked out well, I think. Well, we, no, that hasn't gone live, right? We did a lot of testing on it. And it seemed to work. Um, but that's something that has to go live. Actually, William, um, I did think of one thing uh, I would just say is like Tina mentioned, um, you need a Patrick or somebody like me uh, to, to help out and all this sort of stuff. I mean, I have now real, I mean, I didn't know anything about CBCRM or all of this. I, I now see that there is a whole ecosystem of like uh, consultants or people who, you know, uh, who know a lot more and can efficiently help a charity um, uh, implement a system. Um, and yeah, it does take some budget. It's not a zero budget, uh, and we didn't go down that route because we didn't know about it. And uh, and Tina's charity is currently small, and so on and so forth. But I suppose um, you know, I, I wouldn't. I hope that wouldn't scare people off. If the system looks interesting, obviously, I think the next thing to do would be to get in touch with one of these consultants who implement it for a living. I don't know, William, you might work in that kind of a company and, and see what's possible. Yeah, so I think that was one of the questions is where can we find a Patrick? So yeah, there is a list of um, partners on the Civi CRM website. So that's where you can find someone and there's, there's people all over the world and different organizations. So um, that's a good place for starting point. Mm -hmm. um, and there were there's some other questions in the shared document that you haven't answered okay. yet, Patrick. Um, um, so there's one about um, um, using CV yeah. member we didn't use that no uh, we did turn it on but i guess it's not immediately appropriate because tina doesn't have members it's not like a club and so on and so forth um i'm actually volunteering for another organization right now and they're not looking for a crm system but if they were then that membership uh, module would be really important um but i don't think it was it just wasn't it didn't fit with the kind of business logic or logic of the organization. And so we did turn it on, it's, it's available there, but we didn't make any use of it. That's that one. Um, where can you find a Patrick? Well, yeah, I think there are lots of them out there, but you just have to go looking. Um, changing layouts for different contact types. Yeah, that was Tina's uh, brainchild. That's very nice, actually. So the way you, uh, I can't remember, there was an extension to do that, wasn't there, Tina? Um, I don't know, but uh, by the way, at the end of the PowerPoint, and I forgot to show it, there is a list of all the extensions oh, yeah. that we use. So, and so Patrick has put that on the PowerPoint, it's really helpful. Um, I don't know if it was an extension, but in, Oh, I can't remember. See, this is the thing. I know how to do it. I can show you in my system if that's helpful. Do you want me to share screen and show you? I think that would be helpful. I think it might be the contact layout editor. Yeah. Is that the um, one? Right, yeah. Okay, is that an extension? So yeah, I'll show you how it works. Um, and I was going to say, I, I will share the presentation with everyone so they'll have access to those links. So at the top here, in within your so this is the Shoreditch layout. Within that, there's this thing on the right hand corner, and it says layout. So if you go into that, the, the so I, a layout for care, the layout for volunteer, a layout for staff, a layout for residents, referees, organisations, and then the system default. So if, if I've got a contact that doesn't fit any of those others, it just goes mm -hmm. to the system default, and then you just drag and drop each one how you want it. That's how you do that. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so the, the next question was, could Civi CRM be used for a referral system? Could I just explain what I mean by that? So what we have is um, we have a separate database for a referral system that we run where we get inquiries for certain types of um, uh, service provision. And then we have someone go through and we have look through um, options to send them 
uh, referral contact details. Yeah, so we can just a classic referral kind of system. So I guess we'd need to have an input of the data from the referral inquiry, and then we're looking: can we then have something which is then separate for the contact? You know, the the, the contacts that could be linked together so that it could be sort of more an automated process of referrals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know what comes to your mind, Tina. What comes to my mind is like the nursing home referral functionality. So I don't, I don't know if this has gone live yet, Tina. So and I'll try. Yeah, and it, it has. Yeah. yeah it has, has it? So we have yeah, so, um, yeah. people can. Um, there's a Google form on our website for referrals. Um, so people refer care home residents to us, and then that goes through the form processor in our system and um, a case is opened and then it's up to the case manager to then go through the journey with that person so whether you could automate specific links possibly i'm not sure but that that's how we do referrals yeah so like then i, I guess to expand on the technology there then is so we have a google form to actually uh, collect the referral um this form processor this is the automation the automation with the form that has come in and the kind of automation that happens is uh so there's a case management system in cv crm cv case um and so i guess the automation opens up a case to deal with that referral assigns it to one of the um case workers based upon location i suppose um so there could be yeah I, I, so that's i guess the basic kind of uh, use we make of it but the ingredients you basically have is yeah you do have the capability to take in forms to automatically act on them you have a case management system and you have the possibility of adding other rules that would uh, trigger emails to be sent back out with uh, material <laughs> all that kind of stuff yeah wow okay that's really helpful and i guess we'd find either through stack exchange or a consultant a way to move forward on yeah, that. yeah 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 Thank I was you. just going to add that I know of an organisation in Newcastle that uses CBCRM for referrals. So they're a charity that works with young people and that's their referral system. So they have quite a complicated process whereby there's various different parties involved. So you have um, the person that's being referred, but also their family members, their parents, um, um, school contacts, social workers. So there's a lot of contacts that are created within CIVI CRM and various relationships that are linked together. Great. Should we move on to the next question? I'm not quite sure I understand this question. It said, what's the link to Stack Exchange and Google Form Connector? Um, whoever asked that, could you? Explain what you mean. I, I think I understand that, and so will Patrick probably. I think in there's a link in the PowerPoint, the, the particular thing on Stack Exchange, it's an API script that you have to put into um, the script section of your Google Form, but it's, it tells you the AZ of exactly how to do it. Great, thank you. I'm glad you understood the question. <laughs> Um, and then there's another question about the layouts. How do you cope with contacts with multiple hats? That's quite a common one. Yeah, so volunteer think... and another subtype. So when on that layout page where you've got the different layouts, it prioritizes. So if someone like for me, I'm a volunteer as well, because I go into a care home and visit residents. So I'm a volunteer, but I'm also staff. Um, it gives me the volunteer layout because that is above the um, staff layout in the priority section. So it just chooses which one. Great. OK. Um, were there any other questions that haven't that I've missed or haven't been asked or that you've just thought of? So feel free to turn on your camera and um, your microphone and ask directly if there's any other questions. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you, Tom. Yep. Uh, I was just going to uh, ask if uh, all of the uh, types of relationships can be supported by uh, CVCRM. I, I, might, I mean, it's based on uh, MySQL, isn't it? So I would imagine that, uh, that it could, but you never know. Sometimes these things are... Um, 
limitations are on afterwards. I mean, can you do one to many relationships, many to many relationships, uh, enforce referential integrity, all that sort of thing? Um, well, I won't answer from the super SQL detail thing. Um, I mean, you certainly can have one, one to many, right? Because you can have one organization with many employees or many volunteers. Um, yeah, you can also have uh, the other way around, many to one, because you can have one volunteer who's taking care of uh, several different residents. I've probably got the terminology the wrong way around there. But yeah, um, maybe what's interesting, Tom, is, Tina, I, I think that's one really great use if you've made of it, is all these relationships. So maybe you could just say, like, some of the relationships, I've I'd mentioned two of them there, I guess, but maybe you could just mention some of the relationships that you've built in amongst the contacts in the organization in the database now. Um, just trying to think. So we have lots of different relationships. So it could be the referee for or the referee of um, a certain volunteer. It's, you can have the volunteer to a certain care home. Um, so if I click on that organisation, I can see all the volunteers at that care home. Um, is it we have is a member of a particular church? Um, that you can add, you can add to whatever you want really to the relationships. Um, yeah, so, so yeah. I, I guess that many to one and one to many definitely has that and quite wide use has been made in that. And uh, like one thing I'm kind of proud of is, for example, I'm not sure we're fully using this yet, um, tracking volunteer hours. We came up with a really nice solution for that. So we tracked the volunteer hours as activities with the duration, um, but we, we kept track of who the resident is and Oh, I think we just lost past Patrick. It's been so what there? Yeah, so we're, that's in our kind of next process of that we're working towards is volunteer yeah, was, stewardship. Yeah, it was quite off there. Sorry, I, I dropped off. I was mid, mid flight. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say that uh, I think one thing I really liked was this tracking of volunteer hours, uh, which we tracked as, as activities. But the nice thing was all the relationships because the activity kept track of who was the volunteer doing the volunteering and who was the resident receiving the benefit of the volunteer. But then we also had the resident and so on. So you can, then Naltini is able to run reports like, well, what's the total number of hours that have been volunteered against a certain nursing home? Or, you know, how many volunteer, how many, how many hours of volunteering has um, such and such person given over the last three months? Or how many residents are they taken care of and so on? So that that's quite nice. It all comes out of the relationships. Um, without running any SQL queries or anything like that. So will it also do tidying up of um, uh, records if you need a client will then delete yeah. all the uh, dependent records as well? Yeah, I, I have noticed like if I delete an activity, it uh, it does clean up the relationship, I think. So like if, if, so, if a volunteer were had volunteered uh, some hours for some particular resident and you deleted that activity, then that relationship between the volunteer and the resident would no longer exist, at least not on the strength of that activity, maybe some other activity they had done. So yeah, that seems to work. Uh, presumably you can archive records as well as deleting them, can you? Archive, I don't know, maybe William would know that. Um, I mean, you can certainly, um, I mean, I guess it depends what you want to do in terms of archiving them. So the, the, you could put them into different groups. So you could have a sort of active group of contacts and then um, have other groups that are not in that group. Right. Um, you can, there's a two-step deletion process. So when you delete one uh, contact, it doesn't delete it permanently. It puts it into a sort of deleted item area. Um, and yeah, Rebecca, you're going to add to that? Yeah, I think in terms of relationships, because you also have the start and end dates and the is the relationship active. So if you know that someone can only or is only volunteering for six months, that will sort of automatically not quite archive, but disable the relationship. So you can track on just active relationships rather than those that are no longer active without losing any of the historical data you may have had. So it's not that you need to delete it and suddenly would end up losing, you know, hours recorded last year. That I guess that's because I work with another volunteering agency. They they sort of track that. And for them, the the archived relationship are the often the 
inactive ones. Thank you. Great. Were there any other questions that we haven't already covered? So someone's asking about um, the youth organisation. So it's Children North East. Um, I think Barry mentioned that earlier. Were there any other um, questions? If not, I think I will ask Corinne to turn off the recording and we can move to the more informal part of the meeting. <laughs>